trying hard to get on turn and closing. What's up, boys? Hanging right-handed. The prize snatched from his grasp. Bindari wins the national. Three gold cups, best mate. One of the great horses in, in racing folklore, really, in the, in the last 20, 30 years, ridden by the man on my right, Jim Cullity, who went on to train a gold cup winner in Lord Windermere in 2014. And for good measure, the year that best mate first won the gold cup, 2002, he picked up a spare ride in the Grand National. When things are going your way, you know what happens with Bindari. Wow. What a what a career in, in so many different respects. I, I was just reflecting with you that... You might not have even ridden best mate in the Gold Cup if if everyone had steered you in a different direction because you had a choice that year, didn't you? Yeah, there was Lord Noly <clears throat> that had I'd won the RSA in him the year before. Yeah. Um, he was proven around Cheltenham better, more so than best mate because the year before, two years before, uh, best mate was favourite for the Arkle. Yeah, but it was off with foot and mouth. Uh, then he went straight to the Gold Cup. Um, it was they all tried to make out he's a doubtful stayer, etc., etc. A lot of the kind of form experts were telling me Lord Nody's the, the one. I kind of seen one thing or another. Best mate, in my mind, was promising a lot more, and it was a no-brainer. For, it was actually a no-brainer for me, despite they were trying to convince me to go the other way. But for me, it was always going to be best mate. Thank God it was. <laughs> and presumably, there was at no point did did Henrietta Knight or Terry Biddlecombe try and divert you the other way. They didn't steer me really, no, they kind of, you know, it was kind of my choice. Um, everybody had an opinion, but I, I don't think, I can't seem to remember Hen or Terry um, guiding me either way because best mate would have been an unknown, at, he was unproven over the trip, basically. He was, and people tried to say he was so classy, you know, he arguably should have won a Supreme Novice Earl, which two miles. Um, and he did show a fair bit of pace, so a lot of people said, well, he can't show that much pace and then stay. For me, he was always going to be better over further. So, um, yeah, it was a no-brainer for me, as I say, but, yeah, um, thankfully, <laughs> we've made the right decision. How did you get him beaten the Supreme? Uh, uh, <laughs> do you want me to be really honest? <laughs> yeah, go on. Um, There's enough to put water under the bridge now. You, yeah. can, you can open the colour files. Yeah, it was... Um, I, I had very little experience around Cheltenham. Um, that was my first time ever going there with a horse with a chance. Seriously? Yeah. Um, uh, and basically, Terry, who Terry Biddlecombe, whom I got on brilliantly with, Hen never really interfered with Hen trained the horses, but she never really interfered with the jockeys' riding tactics and all that. Um, but Terry did, and we used to discuss a lot. But and if I, if he had advised me to do something in a race, and if I felt it was the wrong thing to do, I'd say that, mm. and he'd often say, "Well, do whatever you like then." <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but this was Cheltenham, and we did fancy best mate. Uh, the pressure was on, and I hadn't experienced to be cocky and tell him what well, I don't actually agree with that. Anyway, my instructions were, there was a favourite of J.P. McManus's, written by Conrad Dwyer. I think you'll never walk alone, was it? I think it might have been, yeah. yeah. It was Christy Roaches? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was favourite, and Terry said, follow the favourite. Up his backside, follow him, till you get to the last and overtake him. That was my instructions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was down to start, and I said to Conor O'Dwyer, uh, what are you doing, Conor? He said, good and handy, down the inner. I said, perfect. Uh, so I lined up, up his ass. He couldn't lie up. He couldn't lay up. He hit him going to the first. <laughs> he, could, he couldn't lie up. So he was being shuffled. He was shuffled coming back. So plan B. Well, it wasn't a plan B. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, as you can imagine, there was about 22 runners, uh, were down the inner, completely boxed in. He was being shuffling back. I was up his ass. I was being shuffled back, 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 and I just ended up way out of my ground over two miles. And um, 
then as the race unfolded, they spread out down the hill, I kind of struggling to get a run down the inner. In hindsight, if it was a year later with the experience I gained in that following 12 months, I would have just sat where I was and bided my time and you'd eventually get, you know, when the rail opens up, you'd eventually get a run, but I didn't. I panicked and went to go around a few and ended up getting pushed quite wide and I was flying at the death. <coughs> Should have won. Uh, I never watched the replay. I was kicking myself. I was borderline suicidal after it. Um, contemplated giving up being a jockey. I thought it's the end of my career and all the things that a young, inexperienced jockey feels when something goes wrong on the big stage. Um... Um, I never ever watched the replay until about, I'd say, three years ago. I was sitting down at home watching television and they showed the replays of old Cheltenham's. And I looked at it and I thought, sure, I didn't actually give them that bad a right? <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't actually as bad as what I thought. <laughs> but the end result was uh, two days later, uh, I was riding Lord Noly in the RSA and he had a, some sort of a chance, you know what I mean? But he was kind of wasn't the best jumper in the world and one thing or another. And uh, my instructions again were first three. <laughs> Being the first three, da, 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 and I was thinking, to go and go too quick, he's not a good enough jumper to get competitive early. He'll end up making bad mistakes. So I just, I just hope my career's over anyway. That was where my, my frame of mind was at the time. Uh, I'm going to do what I think is best. I went down to the start. I walked out last on the outside. Yeah, first three, down the inner. Um, <laughs> those are my instructions. Uh, as it happens, I walked out last on the outside, tipped way around, got the horse jumping, ended up in a lovely rhythm, and went and won. And... It was, that was a massive, massive turning point in my career as a jockey because I was champion amateur. I was a cocky yeah. young fellow. I, t- I was not a bad rider. I wasn't a brilliant rider, but I wasn't a bad rider for an amateur, seven pound claiming amateur. But I was, but I had a hell of a lot of confidence. Then I had injuries, and then came that riding best mate, and my confidence was gone. And then I remember um, actually there was only three days then. So the Thursday night we were out, like Cheltenham was over. We were out having a few drinks at home in the local pub and Norman says, um, how'd you get on during the week? Norman Williamson, how'd you get on during the week, Jim? I said, uh, well, best mate got beaten. Oh, bloody hell, yeah. Worst ride, wor- worst ride at Cheltenham. <laughs> and I said, Lord Nody won. Uh, best ride at Cheltenham. Oh, that was nice. And do you know what I mean? That was nice, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I, I remember you starting out as an amateur and making, I mean, you quite self-deprecating here because you made a serious impression for an amateur. I mean, that's the last time I remember... Someone with a mister. You, know, you turned up to Ascot one day, I think, one four, didn't you? Three at Ascot. Three, three at Ascot. More Her- Sally, I remember you riding him. Yeah, that was actually... Yeah, that was, was an amateur... Was it the same day? I don't know. Well, anyway, I was there. Can't remember. Whatever. I can't remember if it was the same day. But it was, yeah. it was a big impression you made, <coughs> either which way. 13 winners in a week. Yeah. As a seven-pound claiming amateur. It was amateur. around there. That was that, was that year, yeah. Yeah, 13 winners in a week. As a, as a seven-pound claiming amateur against professionals was kind of unheard of, to be fair, yeah. <clears throat> so really, you had little choice but to to kick on and and do this for a living. Yeah, I mean, the idea was to get going as an amateur. In hindsight, I probably left a lot of money behind me because I would have got the same. I was riding against professionals. I would have got the same rides as a professional. Um, uh, but I was kind of being led that way a little bit by Hen and Terry. It was and it was and I I don't regret it. It was a great way to start and kind of. But unfortunately, I got injured the following year because. Uh, Barry Fenton and David Walsh tied for the Conditional Jockeys Championship the following year and I finished two behind them but I was out for nearly four months with an injury so um, kind of held my career back but look I ended up kind of stable with jockey for Henry at night after all that and sure look I, as you say I had a great career I was very lucky and, and you, there are very few jockeys who effectively stay in one place throughout their entire career which is which is what you did yeah, well, I retired very young, you see. Um, retired at 32, which is, you know... By now, by modern standards, yeah. Yeah, very they're young. all 40, 41, 42 now. Mm. Um, but, uh, I, look, I was getting a lot of bangs in the head, and I was I noticed that my concentration level was going to... Gone to you know, it was before the internet, really, but, you know, you get the racing post every morning, you read an article, well, I'd end up reading the first paragraph start the second one and you'd f- I'd, I was, uh, my concentration level was so bad my mind would be after drifting off and I kind of knew that I wasn't kind of as sharp as I was intelligence wise mm-hmm. a couple of years pre- few years previously and I thought this is constant bangs on the head like. so I just thought I don't really want to end up brain dead mm-hmm. and m- I always wanted to train and I bought a farm and all that so I just kind of it was just a for me it was just a kind of a um, what's the word a kind of um, sort of natural yeah natural progression yeah and also, there are so few people who've got these 
jewels in, in their career as well. You know, three gold cups with best mate. You know, an iconic horse. Everybody talks about him um, in, in the early 2000s. What made him the perfect horse for that race? Well, you know, it's interesting you ask that question right now because we're obviously heading into Cheltenham next week and everybody's talking about the drop of rain and I think the one thing you have to, you know, I was watching the interviews about Shiskin and all that, the one thing you've got to do around Cheltenham is stay. You've got to be, you got to, like, you've got to, you've got to be able to stay two or three furlongs further in the trip, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Like a genuine two-miler that gets two miles at a high pace won't necessarily be the best horse in the Queen Mother because you need a horse that nearly stays two and a half. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Again, the Gold Cup, best mate. He, he had all the class to, and the speed and all that, but what he really did was he stayed. He never, ever got to the bottom of them. Uh, I, they're, they're very different horses in many respects, and, and best mate never sprinted up the hill quite like Aplutar did last year, but I, I thought the one thing that Aplutar reminded me of was the way that best mate economised his effort on the way round. So you could almost not notice him in a race. He could just... He could waste no no air no no time in the air, waste no ground. You could yeah. have him down the inside. Everything was about economy with him, and that's that, that's the sign of a true stare. That's why they stay, give themselves a chance to stay. You know. <clears throat> um, was he ever a difficult horse to ride? <clears throat> Absolute. Um, I suppose if you, well, I knew him. I found I found him extremely easy because I knew him. Um, but I suppose if he did jump off upsides in front, he would actually, he could actually probably run a bit keen, so he just never did that, do you know what I mean? I think I made the running on him once in the Peterborough Chase because nobody else wanted to make it, but he was not a front runner, he, he hated it, do you know what I mean? But he was just a different class than the other, so he won. And the only actually actual thing which he never ever got credit for, credit for, his only weakness, I suppose, was um, soft ground, he hated it. So I actually, if you actually look at all his form, the only time he was ever beat, beaten was when the world soft was on fast ground. If you remember the middle gold cup when he won, I know it wasn't a great gold cup. But, but it was a baking day, wasn't it? It was. There was the year there was quite a few injuries at Cheltenham because it was and all the uh, records were broken and everything um, because uh, it, the ground was rattling. You know, it was, it was firm. And um, uh, oh my God, we jumped off. I remember Martin, Roddy Green wrote a. 60-61 shot from Martin Pipe and his that was having his first run in the UK had come from France and uh, his instruction it was bought to run in the Gold Cup um, and but it wasn't good enough but his instructions were go as fast as you can for as long as you can oh my I run I run the Queen Mother that year and I promise you I've never actually looked at the sectional times but I can get I, it'd be interesting to look back because we went faster in the in the Gold Cup than the Queen Mother that year and um, and best mate was in my hands, running away the whole way. Like, even I was thinking, you're going to have to be some horse to keep going at this, and he quickened off it, and away he went. Fast ground, he loved it. That was his day, really, wasn't it? The middle Gold Cup, that was the day where he really looked like a proper superstar. And, you know, he got a lot of publicity about it. I remember he uh, put down as one of the greatest weight-carrying performances of all time, and I think think it was called the first first National Bank Chase or something, Mm -hmm. he asked it once. He got beaten by... Seabold McCoy, ground was soft. I hit, fr- I hit front a bit too soon, but it was the ground beat him. They put it down as great weight par- carrying performance, but it was ground beat him. If the ground was better that day, he wouldn't have been beaten. Do you know what I mean? So he was actually better than they were trying to make out because he hated the ground. <coughs> Did you? In, we were talking to Michael Buckley earlier about you know how, as a participant, when you've got a horse of huge profile, you can actually, how much, at the extent to which you can actually enjoy the ride. Did you did you enjoy it and appreciate it while no. it was happening? No, the pressure was unbelievable. It was a nervous wreck before all those races. Everybody they called, they called me Cool Jim because I was kind of cool in the race, but the build up to the race I was, I was a nervous wreck. And then you get on the horse, but that, I, I find that those good horses when you get on them, they're proper men. Like they they give you confidence when you get on them. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Because they're just proper men. Nothing phases them, and you can then be confident on them. But um, no, there was a lot of pressure with best mate. I, after each of those big races, like the the initial uh, emotion is um, relief, then enjoyment. But it's relief first, thank God. And even though clearly, you know, Henriette and I and you had a, a great relationship, and you rode all the horses effectively, 
there were times when you were injured where McCoy would get on best mate and I think he won a King George on him, didn't yeah, he? Yeah. W- was that often playing on your mind? Look, I'm only, I'm only one screw up away from but being replaced on this horse for good. Uh, yes and no. Uh, that's the thing about being a jockey, the old saying, uh, you're only as good as your last ride. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Um, and every jockey will go through a stage, whether the public can see it or not, but you'd know yourself, I'm riding well. Or I'm not riding well. Do you know what I mean? You'll know it yourself. But so that's why jockeys give themselves a very hard time, even though the public wouldn't necessarily see that, because you're always when you meet Joe Public or you're interviewed or everything. You know, your job is to be upbeat and positive and etc. But no, you can be beating yourself up because you, you're not always riding that well. You go through confident times and lack of confident times. Um, <clears throat> What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I think you answered it, which was, you know, the extent to which you were, you, you were secure, I suppose, in your, Sorry, yeah. in your, in your position. No, I was, I was secure on best mate. I mean, I had the backing fully of Henrietta Knight, uh, Terry Bilkham and Jim Lewis. Mm. Um, Who we sadly lost just the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so, no, I wasn't worried about that, but... When you're riding a horse like him, really, that is expected to win, and you know in your heart and soul, the only way he can't win is if I, A, fall off him, B, cock it up, do you know what I mean? So, um, a lot of pressure is on, but I suppose it's like all those um, uh, great sportsmen or even pop stars, you know, you hear about, who was it, um, Robbie Williams or somebody used to vomit before he'd go on stage because the nerves, but you need that to then... Be at your best, you know what I mean. So you needed that fear to adrenalise you, and I did anyway. Yeah, get you in the, get you in the right did, space. I did. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you don't go to Plumpton on a twenty to one shot and get as nervous as you do before a favour in the Gold Cup. Do you know I, what I mean? I bet you weren't that nervous going out to ride Binderi in the Grand National, though, were you? I wasn't. To be honest. <laughs> Funny that total spare ride. But you see, that's a, a, that's a, another thing. Um, Cheltenham is the be all and the end all. I mean, it is the Olympics, and the build up to it is massive. Um, the pressure is massive when you're on fancied horses, uh, and you, time of the time of the time of the year. Then once you get that behind you, you actually go, you relax a little bit. Then you go to entry, which from all those kind of Lamborn jockeys and everything, it's all miles away. So you go up there, stay overnight, and you have a bit of fun. You let your hair down a little bit, and then the Grand National. There is never going to be pressure in the Grand National because it is still a lottery at the end, of, a bit of a lottery. I know it's less than it was, but. From a jockey's point of view, if you get brought down at first, well, you can't necessarily be considered... It's not necessarily yeah. your fault. So you're unlikely to be fearful of a lot of scrutiny for giving one a terrible ride. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I got brought down the best mate in the Gold Cup, I would blame myself, because mm-hmm. I shouldn't have been behind that horse. Don't worry, everybody else would have blamed but, you as well. Yeah, yeah. But, um, in the, um, but in the Grand National... Things, things like that are almost expected to happen, so therefore, no pressure. And, and I, it was, it's weird that, that winning a Grand National was almost a foot, ended up being a sort of footnote, a so glorious footnote in your career. Yeah, it was, um, it was Nigel Twist and Davis' third string, the least fancied of his three. Um, very unfortunately for Jamie Goldstein, he'd broken his leg on Wednesday, and I got the call up to ride him. I was riding another horse, it was like number 42 or 3, Brow Joshi for Mark Pittman. Um, and I just phoned Mark and said, Mark, look, I have this horse. He's definitely going to get in, which yours isn't. And he would have a little chance. It's like a 25 to one shot or something. He would have a little chance. He stays and he jumps. I think he's a Welsh national winner. And um, he kind of said, well, you know, he gave me a bit of abuse, but said yes. And uh, the rest is history. And that little switch to the inside, was that one of those instinctive, inspired moves that won you the race? Well, it probably was in the end, but um, I don't know how to talk. <laughs> it's a funny one. Um, if, I was, if I was to knock Dickie Johnson, I'd t- I think he hit the front too soon. Mm. I think if he sat behind me, he would have beaten me. <laughs> but he kicked. He kicked, but he didn't get away. And that gave my horse a bit of... Had he kicked and gone away, we would never... Bindery wouldn't have given that extra kick. But because he passed us, we looked like being beaten but he actually didn't go away from us. And I could see Binder, oh, well, I was thinking, and Binder was thinking, we actually still have a chance here. And that's just the kind of, when, when you get a horse at the end of four and a half miles, you've got to do something to get him to change legs or do something mm. to get another run out of them. And that was kind of what did it. 
Um, but that's instinctive. You know, that's just instinctive. You couldn't tell somebody to do that. It's just. <clears throat> but that's nowhere near the the least predictable or strangest thing that happened in your career. I mean, Lord Windermere, when you started training at 2014, winning that absolutely zany gold cup where they were spread out all across the track and then you had to survive a half an hour stewards inquiry to keep the race. That must have been a very, very different experience for you, wasn't it? 100%. <coughs> He's the purple colours, by the way, with the yellow cap. For those who've forgotten this, <laughs> one of the weirdest gold cups ever. I know I went too fast, didn't I? <laughs> and was, that, was that really just the, the, be the, 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 the beginning and end of it? They went too quick. Um, so David Russell was a very, very good friend of mine, even though publicly we were perceived to have fallen out. We never did. We're great. We're really good friends. Um, uh, but David does have a bit of a mind of his own, mm. and they went very quick in that. Uh, Lord Windermere's form was a bit in and out that season. Um, and when Davy was kind of thinking, this isn't going to happen today, uh, he was kind of thinking, but, so I'm not going to abuse the horse, I'm going to save him for Punchestown. And I was watching him going around thinking, he's getting further and further back, but he hasn't even so much as hit him down, given him a slap down the shoulder like. And the horse is jumping brilliantly, and yet, yes, he's out of his ground, but I could also see they are going a million miles an hour, they cannot keep going. And literally, about a mile from home, and I did fancy the horse as well to run a big race, not necessarily win, but I did fancy him to run a big race and Dr. Lamb and all his buddies had a fortune on him like at massive prices. And um, I was watching the parade ring with Dr. Lamb and um, watching on the big screen and he said, oh, this is embarrassing, Jim, and he went to walk away. And I said, whoa, Ronan, whoa, <laughs> whoa, these are going to stop. I bet, you'll, I bet you'll finish in the frame. It's about a mile from home. He was still tailed off. And sure enough, he passed one, passed another, passed another, and and the rest is history, but yeah, um, I never lost faith. But I could kind of see what I could see what Davy was doing because I was watching closely. I was just watching my horse really, and I could and um, I could see that he'd never he he'd never asked him like he never asked him to lie up. And uh, uh, I said he will come with a rattle because I know the horse as well, and he does he did stay. You know what I mean? I said he will come with a rattle at the end, and these have gone too quick. They will stop like classic Cheltenham Gold Cup kind of thing. So uh, yeah, so. You've I celebrate. I celebrate. Bit Go different. On. Bit different now from riding it, where you kind of, kind of takes a minute for it all to sink in and all that. But that when you train one and you've, he had problems as well. So I was like, put a lot of man hours into him to get him right for the day. So was that almost a better moment for you? Uh, touch wood. I, I shouldn't say that because best mate was amazing. But yes, it was. I, the man hours. Lord Windermere was very straightforward, until the, and he won the RSA. And he ended, didn't end up in a bad handicap mark, so we put him away, and I was going to exploit a, good, a decent handicap mark in the Hennessy mm -hmm. at Newbury the following mm -hmm. year. And he was a bit disappointed. He finished fifth or sixth, but he actually came home a bit sick, a bit jarred up. The ground was quick as well that day, uh, first time out. He was a little bit jarred up in his legs, um, and he had came back with a bit of a cough, and he obviously a slight touch of travel sickness or something. He, he just well, he got a bit sick, and um, yeah, he was he was a he was a difficult horse horse to train after that. So his form has been in and out. But I was kind of minding him, trying to get him a hundred percent right, getting a couple of quiet runs into him. Just and it was all a build up for Cheltenham, and it came off, which is you have no idea of the um, satisfaction I got out of it. And so, you know, obviously people are watching now thinking, God, this guy's had an amazing career as a jockey and he's trained a Cheltenham Gold Cup winner and that was it. Didn't tra doesn't train anymore. And what's taken you away from, what's taken you away from the game? Um, well, I was training in Ireland. Mm. It is very difficult to train horses in Ireland. The, the, it is so competitive. Um, there aren't enough choices for horses to be able to guide them like I always said at the time you could have you could have a medium ability horse in England and train him cleverly for four or five years and you could win ten races with him yeah. that same horse in Ireland might never win a race and the going about the prize money is so much better in Ireland we should have a horse in Ireland da, da, da. but they just have to be better 
the standard is just higher. Even lower grade, the standard is higher the whole way through. It's just more difficult to win races. And it's, you can see it now at Cheltenham every year. Do you know what I mean? So were you disheartened? By, were you just growingly disheartened by that and thought, well, there's, there's no point. I've I'd, done what I'd, I can do. I trained, I trained th- three Cheltenham Festival mm-hmm. winners. Because Spring it won the Kim year as well. Spring Heel, yeah. Spring Heel, sorry. Yeah. Spring um, I had a few other winners in England. And... Uh, the percentage of my overall winners in England and Ireland like, is ridiculous. The, the, the percentage that I had in England is ridiculously high compared to Ireland because it's just hard to win. You, know, you get a horse absolutely set up and you'd, you'd never be confident enough to say this is a certainty but this is as close to a certainty as I can have and you bring it for a nice race at Leperstown or somewhere and uh, finish second. <laughs> I had a horse set up one day. Oh, God. What was his name? It was one of those Concords. I can't remember his name. I'd been set up for a big handicap at um, Leopardstown. And I had everything right. <clears throat> it was a tricky horse, but I got everything right. And uh, went there, finished second. Mm-hmm. I was gutted. And beaten by one of Willie Mullins, is owned by J.P. McManus. And Willie pulled me aside after, Jim, don't be disappointed with your horse, uh, this fella. They'd exploited a French handicap mark in an Irish thing. <laughs> you and you he can't had, win, can you? And he, and he literally had three stone in hand. I, yeah. thought, I thought I had a stone in hand. They had three stone in hand. Got beaten. And it was just, that's just a classic. But that happened loads of times. It's just tough. Mm. So, so the, but you had the presence of mind just <clears> to say, right. No, that, that wasn't it. I still would have carried on and probably just started doing what a lot of them do, run more in England, etc. Uh, but no, uh, my personal circumstances changed. Uh, fam- uh, family, kids... Had to, it's very hard to do, do, do two careers very well, and it's basically uh, my my wife and I split up. She moved back to England with the kids. I had to. I then spent a lot of time in England with the kids. Yeah, trying to train horses, and it just didn't work. So I just gradually let it wind down, and with the view of concentrating on the kids, make keep myself available for the kids give them as good an upbringing as possible and might go back into it. I started a farm in Ireland and everything. Um, <clears throat> uh, but now, and, and I constantly think, actually, you know, maybe I live up in Leicestershire now in the Midlands and I think, you know, this is, this is a good place to train from because, you know, you've got access to the north, access to the south, etc., etc. It's quite an affluent area. Um, and I, it crossed my mind at least once a week to kind of start training in a small way and I feel my way and if I like it I like it and get bigger and if it doesn't happen it doesn't happen but uh, my big worry is the staff situation the workforce in racing is uh, it's, a, it's just a major issue in racing like just getting people to work people to ride out who can actually ride yeah you can get kids out of racing school and things like that but you end up doing a lot of work yourself and I don't really fan- you know I don't mind working but I don't fancy doing all the work and sacrificing everything else you know what I mean mm. so it's, that's that's the major problem stumbling block yeah I mean you read it read the racing post every day and the punters are going mad because the bookies keep closing down their accounts and all this crack of checking where their money comes from and um, the BHA doing whatever they're doing with racing which I don't agree with almost any of it um, but uh, from a racehorse trainer's perspective is perspective. Staff is the number one problem. I mean, you can't train horses without people to ride them out. Well, you've raised all sorts of all sorts of issues that uh, unfortunately we don't have time to talk about now. Which <laughs> that's I, I raised at the end. That's nice I raised at the end. end. <laughs> uh, but the most important thing is there may yet be another chapter to what's been uh, a pretty extraordinary story so far. But my daughter is going to start point to pointing soon, so I'm definitely going to train a couple of point to pointers and see where that takes me. Best of luck, Jim. Thanks so much for talking to us. Thank you, Nick. Enjoy this week. Seven days from now, it'll all look so different. Bye-bye. Watch live racing now on racingtv.com.